All right, good morning. Uh, as always, the secretary is a very tough act to follow. Uh, I actually would like to leave this up here all day. I want to put in a couple of plugs. Uh, first for the secretary. He has been here year after year after year. His schedule is a train wreck. Uh, and he believes enough in your society to come here and then kick us off pretty much every year. And uh, I thank him for that. Okay. Uh, the second plug I want to make is for your ASNE Day staff. They've done a fantastic job setting this thing up. What an agenda. I, I, if you've read through this, I mean, I want to go to every session, and there are sessions in parallel. Not going to happen for me. Uh, but please stick around and go through all of these sessions. They're, they're just uh, uh, A+. Plus. Um, and while I'm at it, I want to plug your society. A uh, lot of gray hair and bald in the room. You, especially the folks that are not in uniform uh, and are retired out of the service or out of the civilian service, if you want this society to keep going, you need to recruit new members. It's a real sobering thought, the number of folks who stood up that said they were under 35. That's our problem as a society. We need to keep working on that. Now I want to plug my panelists. The three folks you see sitting in front of you are at the top of their food chains for a reason. They're really, really good at what they do. You have a cross-section of the best of the acquisition professional community. You've got air, surface, submarine, AEDO, and EDO represented. Five warfare communities, and I should add the AMDO community, uh, that basically control uh, a significant chunk of the Navy's budget. Let me talk about what's in the CISCOMs. Over 100,000 people, if you count the warfare centers, the depots, and the headquarters. The naval aviation depots, the naval shipyards, the test ranges, the NOCs, NSWCs, NUWCs, Spay War System Centers. The budget that goes through that these folks have to sign off for is somewhere north of $70 billion a year. They have the world's best engineering organizations, the world's best contracting organizations, the world's best finance organizations, and a, and a host of other uh, really top-notch folks. I think I got the count right, but between the three of these guys, they have 13 cohabiting PEOs. I got that right? Five for NAVC, five for NAVIR, three for SPAWAR, all right? So that's the, that's the lion's share of acquisition going through in a partnership that's sometimes tenuous, sometimes seamless, but always, always with the purpose of getting the best stuff in the hands of our sailors and warfighters. So I just wanted to make sure you understood uh, what's there in front of you. Let me talk very, very briefly about their career tracks, because you all know them anyway. Decoy, fighter pilot, test pilot, long career in test and evaluation, uh, program manager, commander of NOC, Air 5.0. Did I get that right, Decoy? Yeah, Air 5.0. It's a double hat organization and now ComNav Air. Willie, AP, submariner, commander Key West, program manager, for the SSGN conversion program. So every time we go and uh, blow away the Libyan Air Force, Willie gets a kudos from me. Uh, PEO submarines, ComNav C, uh, running buddy who pounds me into the ground every Saturday morning running around Burke Lake. Dave, surface warfare officer, engineering duty officer, Aegis Heavy, program manager, vice commander, PEO ships, now comms Bay War. Couldn't ask for a better panel. Uh, so what I want to do is sit down and, uh, and, and ask these guys to talk about, well, uh, what's on your plate? You heard what's on the, on the secretary's plate. Uh, affordability, 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 tough budget environment, uh, increasing threat from China, Russia, and others, non-state actors. Uh, you heard his strategy. Uh, I would like the, the CISCOM commanders, if you would, to uh, please get up here and, uh, and uh, tell us what's on your mind. And, uh, I'll sit down now. Uh, I think we'll go with decoy first. Yes, 
Sir. Right. Um, so we'll just talk from our seats. Um, yeah, we, we are kind of like brothers. It is a little bit of a, of a food fight once in a while. Um, although I am definitely the best leg wrestler, Willie has a couple of chokeholds that you just never see coming, and Dave is devious. So um, we we do uh, we do work things out in the end. Um, and I couldn't think of two better partners to tell you the honest God truth uh, as we go through some really complicated problems. Um, what I like about our relationship is that th we we talk about the hard things and we do it without emotion. We do it with facts, and uh, that's what I love about these two guys. So. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the environment first. Uh, it just bears repeating. We've been 10 years of utilizing the heck out of our equipment. In the aviation community, I'm taking 6,000 hour airplanes to 10,000 hours. These airplanes were designed for 6,000 hours in the harshest environment known to man, and we're taking them to 10. That is an engineering feat, by the way. Um, our demand signal is up, and I don't see it lightening up. I see 10, 20 more years of the same demand signal on this equipment that we've got right now, which is beyond what we planned when we bought it. So we're going to have to get more out of our equipment uh, than we originally planned to get out of our equipment. And I see threats getting much more complex and much faster. Um, so other than that, everything's going great for me. Um, at the same time, we've extracted all of the buffer out of our system. We've extracted all the buffer out of our pilots. We no longer uh, have extra gas to just launch the airplanes and get a little more proficiency. And uh, in the pilot world, um, uh, having your rear in the air, I won't use the uh, real acronym, but having your rear in the air is a quality that you have to have. There's proprioceptive senses in your body that you've got to hone. So you have to have some amount of time airborne. And we're biting into that time airborne. And uh, that is the buffer that is leaving us. We, we some time ago went to a tiered readiness program. We don't stay 100% ready all the time. We go to a very low level of readiness after deployment and then build ourselves back up. So the, uh, we have to carefully manage um, the proficiency of our pilots and that base of knowledge that comes with them. Um, so the buffer is out of our pilot program. There is no more room to go in there and start hacking through the readiness program. In our airplanes, the buffer is out of the system. We used to have enough airplanes at our fleet replacement squadrons that with, when one squadron deployed and they had an airplane that was acting up, they would leave it behind, go to the RAG, get another same type model series lot airplane, bring it in. There's no more of that. We're managing buno by buno on every deployment um, and there is no buffer. So it's a different way of engineering, right? We're engineering our pilots on the margin to make sure they're ready just in time and we're engineering our airplanes uh, differently so they're ready just in time. And that's a different way of doing the, the business of the CISCOMs, at least in the aviation world, than we've been doing it. Um, at the same time, uh, I talked about the more complex missions. Uh, we used to consider training when you got your, what we call an X. When you launch an airplane, you get an X. There's an X in the block, and you get enough Xs, and you are now trained. Training is different than proficiency. And as we find the missions get more complex, we're having to use our brains to get beyond the trained X and get into the proficiency of our air crew. Um, and that's a, that's a real growth uh, industry for us. That's a place where we can make a lot of ground in those air crew who aren't getting as much flight time but need to have a much higher level of proficiency. And the technologies today, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a, in a minute, are really getting there. And I think we're gonna, we, we got a lot of room to improve in that category of getting more proficiency for less money into the hands of our pilots. And then, of course, as Secretary Sackley said, the cost of how we get our effects downrange are going to be real important. Uh, and the way we do that is we do that with a combination of tremendous engineering and tech transfer, great partnerships with our industry partners, and great close coordination with our warfighting operators. Uh, we learned a long time ago in naval aviation that uh, if you uh, have a bunch of geeky engineers that are disconnected from your hard-nosed operators, you are going to sub-optimize your system. So we combine them and we create a community that sits right in the middle of translating between our great technological engineering force and our hard charging warfighting force. And bridging that gap and making that communication happen is how you get the most out of your system uh, and working that side by side. So this concept of brilliant engineers and fast tech transfer with real close correlation and connection with a warfighter so that you take a dot mil PF look at everything you do 
is the foundation of how naval aviation, naval aviation is going to get through this time where we have less money, more demand, hard road equipment, um, and, and it's just a hard problem. But I, I can't think of a better team and a better place to be as I go through it. So I will walk through a few of the things that I'm doing at the Naval Air Systems Command that apply directly to uh, the engineering force, the engineering world, uh, the great talent that I'm fortunate to work with at NAVAIR. Uh, the, the tremendous recruit, recruits that I'm bringing in, the young kids that are coming in, the old graybeards that really know the system, the combination of the two. And I feel very fortunate that my predecessors did not trade away our engineering expertise uh, when the pressure got on. We, we maintained it, and I'm really uh, in a great phase of transitioning it to, it, to modern techniques and modern procedures, uh, and it's very exciting. So first on my list, if you've ever heard me speak, I am relentlessly in pursuit of integrated warfighting capability, and that is the competence of systems of systems engineering. It's been neglected for years. We can't neglect it anymore. It sub-optimizes when you get so platform focused that you sub-optimize across the system of systems. Warfighters fight with a carrier strike group. They don't fight with an F-18 or an Aegis combat system. They want it all to work together, and that is an engineering discipline in and of itself that has tech standards, tech authorities, uh, and people and infrastructure that have to support it. Uh, we, collectively, are really uh, making advances in that regard in how we document tech standards in that, um, in that arena and how we exercise those standards as we integrate ourselves with individual programs of record. It was about five years ago that it hit me in the head. We've tried for years to fund horizontally. It doesn't work. It always gets cut. We no longer want to fund horizontally. The, the money's coming vertically through programs of record. We're just managing the tech authorities horizontally. That was the key in my brain, and um, I call it integrated warfighting capability, um, and we're making a lot of progress. Things like uh, Navy integrated fire control. That is a complicated way of conducting business, and we're going to make it seamless, and we're going to make it seamless through this technique. Uh, in the SUW world, you saw in the news on the 27th of January, we flew a tomahawk into the side of a ship. That was out without buying any new program of record. It was simply taking the system of systems of things that we already have and exist and making them work together in order to create a war fighting outcome. This is how we're gonna afford our future um, and it makes, a, it makes a huge difference. And the discipline can be very clearly applied to things like uh, electromagnetic uh, maneuver warfare. You know, so here we are. It's all about the information, it's all about the bit, it's all about cyber. These techniques and procedures of horizontal integration are gonna to apply to those as well. It's complicated, it's difficult, and we can't wait to get ourselves into it. So that's, that's how we're gonna work this from an engineering perspective. Second thing is common and open architectures. We have to have documented interface, commercial standards, and open standards. We are shifting, make no mistake about it, we are shifting revenue streams in industry. And we need industry's help in partnership with this. The government needs to take control as a lead systems integrator across system of systems outcomes that is very difficult for industry to do. Now, we've advocated it for to industry for years. But who in the world is the industry leader in AAW or SUW? There isn't one. You can't do it because every corporation has intellectual property and intellectual capital in the pillars that they're in. So we believe that as a syscom, uh, you need to work that as a syscom, as a lead systems integrator, to provide the platform so that individual vendors can come in and bring their intellectual property to bear on the system. It's not a land grab against industry. It is the government taking control of standards that we should have taken control of over the years. And open architectures are going to be the key to it. Specifically for aviation, I'm working on scabbing open architected processors on the outside of existing old systems. They may be assembly code, they may be C++. There, there's 27 computers running a whole host of different softwares that are very carefully integrated. I need open architected processors with a transport layer to reach into those. That's one area I'm spending a lot of time. The next is for our future aircraft, we need to go bottoms up on an open architected backbone to where everything shows up as a service on your next airplane. Um, in my euphoric world of the future, I would buy a green airframe with plenty of weight, power, cooling availability, and I would be the lead systems integrator for a common computing environment, and everything would show as a service. A radar would come in as a service. Fusion would come in as a service. That's the way I would architect the next generation airplane. And I've got to train my workforce to be good at that 
so we can write RFPs and write contracts in that direction. Um, two things that I'm doing in that regard is I, I'm building an open architecture lab for us to practice in and uh, work different systems. And I'm going into my test pilot school and taking their systems curriculum airplane, and I'm going to go buy a, an inexpensive prop airplane, and I'm going to make it a flying lab test bed. And we're going to use this on a day-to-day -day basis, um, and we're going to get good at, at this open architected world. Um, next is live virtual constructive and proficiency optimization. This is where we take our great technical intellectual capital and plug it into our warfighting proficiency. Proficiency optimization is taking those X's I was talking about, functionally decomposing them, finding the skills that each pilot needs, and applying the best kind of learning to get that skill. If it's switchology, it may be a low-cost trainer where he can get hundreds of reps and sets before he launches on his Fallon complicated air wing debt where you're launching 30, 40 airplanes. You don't want him to fail in that mission because him or her to fail in that mission because of switchology. You, you want them to be challenged by the mission and not worried about communication, command control, uh, switchology. Those are places that you can get in a simulated environment. And as we build up through the basic intermediate and advanced phases, we need to be able to connect the simulators to live flying airplanes, to an Aegis in port across the land that Dave is, is building for us so that we can communicate and practice these large, complicated NIFCA, SUW exercises on a routine basis. Right now, our air crew are getting one, two, three reps and sets on those, and it's just not enough. Um, and we're going to start managing the proficiency of our aviators and measuring it, because you don't ever get anything that you don't measure. Um, last thing I'll talk about is cyber. Uh, it is the new thing. It's, uh, we're spending a lot of time talking about it. It is uh, not clear. It is complicated. It is fast. Uh, we do not have a great repository uh, skill set. But from an aviation perspective, the notion of a combat system uh, separate and plugging into the gig is, um, is front and center in the way that we're pursuing cyber. A lot of good work is happening on networks and network protection. You can consider our P8s, our F-18s, our H-60 Romeos, multi-port USBs that occasionally plug into the gig. And uh, you know what a USB does when you plug it into the gig. You are, one, subject to the gig hurting you, and two, you are subject to hurting the gig with things that have come into you. Um, our apertures are now sucking up tremendous amounts of information. Typically, I have great competence in any engineering field that I need for aviation. In this one, we are now starting that competence. We're decomposing, we're understanding it, we're building it, we're getting smarter. And I think within, you know, we got about 10 years of pulling steadily on the rope. We'll get better every day. From the combat system perspective, it's different than the network, and it's something that we have to pay a lot of attention to. And I've been reaching out to industry partners, and they're doing a great job. So that is uh, the, the threat and difficulty that I see in the future. These are some of the things that I'm working on. Um, I assure you that we are working in close coordination. It's not always happy and nice, but it is always professional. Uh, and we're making great progress uh, with these great Americans. So thank you. I look forward to your questions. Thanks, sir. I, what I'd like to do is hold the questions to the till the last panelist speaks, if that's all right, and then uh, and then we'll give you enough time to uh, to ask the hard questions. Uh, good for the ship community here from the air community. Uh, Airship integration. You you heard it. Uh, the carrier strike group is the weapon. It's not the Aegis ship or the uh, F-18. Willie, you're up. All right, well, thank, thanks, Sully. Uh, I'd really like to acknowledge uh, ASNI uh, for three things. One, for getting us together, uh, you know, getting us out in front of the, the most important uh, folks to hear our messages and giving us that opportunity for the support that you give to the Navy, both uh, materially in the, in, as part of the supplier base, but also uh, with our friends up the road here that, uh, that provide the money. And then uh, the training efforts that have gone on, I really appreciate uh, everything that ASNI is doing to establish courses for naval engineering and other engineering disciplines that, that are really helping us out and, and keeping our workforce sharp. I'd also like to just give a shout out to Sully. So uh, about 10 years ago, we were uh, trying to figure out what had happened to us. Uh, uh, much of the engineering uh, underpinnings of the Naval Sea Systems Command had been gutted in the late 90s and early 2000s, and we recognized that we were on the wrong path. 
the five PEOs at the time stood up behind Sully, supported him to go uh, make the commitment to rebuild that workforce. And I'm happy to report that uh, your work, Sully, has uh, borne fruit and that workforce is strong today and it's due in great measure to what, what you, you did to stand tall on that day. I really appreciate it. I'd also like to say that that civilian workforce doesn't often get the kudos that it deserves. Uh, over the last 18 months, uh, certainly my workforce, but uh, uh, Dave and Decoys as well, been through a lot. Uh, you know, no, no uh, raise for three years, no bonuses, six days of unpaid vacation, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and in spite of all of that, and, and the things that happened to us in the Navy Yard, in spite of all that, they came to work every day. When we ordered them not to use their Blackberries on the weekends, they gave their, their personal cell phones and their home phone numbers to the fleet and said, call me anyway. And, and for that, I, uh, I tip my hat. Uh, they are an incredibly dedicated uh, group and uh, deserve your thanks for their service. And so please, please give it to, to them when you see them. Uh, So today's panel is about engineering uh, uh, future dominance, and I thought I'd just go around the horn of the shipbuilding programs. I know Secretary Stackley talked on some of them. As I think about shipbuilding, uh, what we build into the ship when it comes out of the delivery yard, uh, what flexibility is built in, what up upgrade ability, up gun ability, I've heard a bunch of different terms, uh, transformability, really is, is what can we put on cost effectively in short availabilities to react to changing threats. Uh, I'll start with LCS. The LCS class is uh, gonna deliver four ships uh, this year and next year and the year after and the year after and the year after. Those are all under contract, under construction are, and are going to break on the fleet uh, like a tidal wave, four per year. And their, and their uh, quality's coming up, the first pass quality and uh, their ability to get through their inserts, all that stuff is all coming up just as every ship pro shipbuilding program does. Always like to point out, each of them comes with about 100 tons, some, some as much as 150 of transformability. What do you want to put in there? You get to choose later and you get to choose without pulling out a bunch of welding torches, without having to recalculate the center of gravity, without having to go do a whole bunch of development to figure out what the ship can support. Those interfaces are defined, they're out there, you can find them. And uh, those mission modules, the first three are, are doing well. Uh, we're in testing of the mine mission module right now. And so I see that as a, a very important trend line. What can you do to the ship without pulling out the welding torches? And, and the more of that you can do, uh, the, more, the more flexible that ship will be and the better it will be for adapting to those long-term uh, threat changes. Uh, the DDG-51 restart is uh, starting to move out. Uh, we'll be buying two or three of those DDGs a year uh, out into the, the medium future. Uh, I'm very proud of the fact that they're being delivered with Aegis Baseline 9, and that is the exact same system we're backfitting on DDGs in major availabilities around the fleet today. That forward fit and back fit, open architected, with the goal being that the next modernization doesn't require a bunch of welding torches. It's uh, changing out blade servers, maybe pulling a little bit more fiber, uh, really does put the surface Navy in the same place that the submarine force has gotten to with uh, open architected uh, uh, federation, uh, submarine warfare federated system, ARCI, that's on all of our submarines. Uh, so those uh, DDGs will start delivering here uh, shortly and you'll see two, two to three of those a year out into the near uh, and, and medium term. Uh, Virginia class, uh, we changed the bow on the block three ships. Uh, first of those was North Dakota, went on trials uh, uh, about a year ago. That ship has an open architected bow. So we used to have little 21 inch vertical launch tubes, 12 of them up in the bow of the ship. Today there are two eight foot diameter tubes, each of which can host six tomahawks, uh, and it uses the exact same payload interface as the SSGNs. Really is a revolution in the way we think about payloads from submarines, and uh, uh, those Virginia classes also have the current backfit, forward fit, uh, sonar combat system suite, uh, and, uh, and continues that legacy of, of making the ship upgradable um, quickly and effectively to be able to react to those future threats. I, I think you heard 
uh, when CNO testified that we are going to give up modernization to balance the budgets. We're going to keep the platforms and give up modernization. But those platforms have to be modernizable so that when the money comes because the threat jumps up, your ability to go get that ship modernized, get it up to the, the most uh, current threats, uh, will be dependent upon how well we architect those ships today. Um, the uh, Virginia class, uh, I will also point out the uh, first year of two per year procurements, uh, the first of those ships, and maybe the second will deliver this year. I think the electric boat is counting on delivering the second ship before the, the end of December, and uh, that, then that will be the standard, two ships delivered a year uh, out into the far, or into the medium term. Uh, I would also uh, point out, you read a lot about the uh, Virginia payload module. So the idea that we'd replace those four SSGNs, uh, 22 uh, uh, D5 missile tubes, think of a tractor trailer st stood on end, right, those 22 missile tubes, they've been pretty useful. The combatant commanders can't get enough of them. In fact, they're running the shafts off those ships, uh, uh, literally. Uh, and so we got to start thinking about when in 2025, 2026, when Ohio, Florida, Michigan, and uh, Georgia go out one a year, what is the fleet going to do to replace them? And that's really what the Virginia payload module is. Again, the very same payload interface as the SSGN and the Virginia bow tube, four of them behind the sail. And I think you'll see that program be accelerated. There's a lot of interest in the Congress in, in bringing that to the fleet. That's, that's a cost-effective replacement for an SSGN a uh, three or four hundred million dollar change to the to a, a Virginia class, not a four or five billion dollar new new ship class. Uh, the joint high speed vessels continue to be the platform of choice for experimentation. Uh, many of you saw the uh, the initial railgun electromagnetic railgun demo. It was done on uh, JHSV out in in uh, San Diego. Our intent is to take a functioning railgun 2C in, in uh, FY16 and fire it from a joint high-speed vessel. What is it about a joint high-speed vessel? 600 tons of payload capacity, 600 tons. So you need to bring generators, bring generators. You need to bring cooling, bring cooling. Uh, power conditioning, et cetera, et cetera. And so it, it becomes a platform of choice for that experimentation and really a Swiss Army knife from that perspective. Now, its primary mission is a bunch, that 600 tons is a bunch of trucks and Marines. Uh, when it's not doing that primary mission, it is pretty, uh, pretty much in demand by every fleet commander that's out there. So you'll see those uh, JHSBs out around. I, I'm going to have a chance to ride the Trenton next week on her, uh, on her acceptance trials. That's all five, and we have uh, five more after that. On the amphibious front, many of you saw that America has done her initial deployment. Uh, operating uh, uh, V-22s uh, and, uh, and really getting ready to be the, the uh, uh, large deck of the future, uh, getting her ready to operate joint strike fighter as well. I think uh, Marines would very much like to have America be the ship uh, out in FDNF, and I, I think you'll see that happen uh, sometime in the next few years. And lastly, the MLP, and I think that is the ultimate in payload volume. I, I don't even know how many tens of thousands of tons of payload capacity are on that ship, but everybody that sees it says, I want some more of those. Uh, many of you saw the, the uh, video of Montford Point, the first um, uh, MLP, uh, ballasted down with its, half its deck awash. On one side, LCACs were driving up, the trucks were driving off of the LCACs and driving up onto the Bob Hope, one of the LMSRs, one of the big uh, pre-positioning ships, and vice versa. And so it really does create a sea base, the first time that we've had sea basing since we said those words back in, in the early 2000s. And so I think the, uh, the uh, AFSB, the one with a big flight deck on top, still has all that LCAC, but then brings in the third dimension of V-22 and the other uh, lift, uh, lift helicopters we have out there. Uh, and I think we're going to get a lot of great use of that. On the horizon, we see two new ship classes that bring a dramatic change to the margins we put in our ships as we think about it. And, and I think of margin as future upgradability. Uh, Zumwalt, uh, groundbreaking in many, many technologies. And we can go argue whether we took on too many and we didn't set the good idea cutoff date early enough. But, but we will deliver that ship. Uh, I expect her to sail down the uh, Kennebec here sometime in the, uh, this calendar year. 
Uh, she comes with a, a computing environment that's revolutionary. She comes with electronic modules and power distribution that's revolutionary. A gun system, uh, uh, peripheral vertical launch, first change to vertical launch since the invention of the Mark 41 vertical launch system, uh, and the volume and power necessary for all those future things. Uh, many of you saw we've begun the studies to go see if there's enough margin in that ship to, to with, without re-architecting the entire ship, fit the, the rail gun on the trajectory it's on onto that ship, and I, and I expect those studies to come out uh, over the next year or so, and, and it is likely that that will be the ship where, where that incredible capability will land. And then the Ford, uh, first new design aircraft carrier in 50 years, uh, some dramatically uh, new systems on board uh, that uh, Deacon and I work together. Uh, the electromagnetic uh, uh, launch system, so a new catapult that disconnects the reactor plant from the flight deck uh, from a steam perspective. Uh, new landing system, new elevators, a new radar, and a new reactor plant. Uh, the the uh, eye-watering one is, of course, this ship's the same size with about a thousand less crew space. And it's got uh, two and a half times the electrical power dis uh, generation of previous ships, power, plenty of cooling. And so you can only imagine the places that that ship will go in the next 80 years of that class of ship's life. Uh, as we look to the future, uh, I know Mr. Stackley talked about this. The LXR AOA was probably the most open dialogue we have ever had about requirements, capabilities, uh, what it costs to build, how we build it, uh, uh, that I can ever remember in all my time doing, working in either in the Pentagon or in acquisition. And I think we got to a very good place. We end up with an LPD health form with a lot less stuff in it. Again, lots of power, lots of space. That is a platform of the future, one that meets that criteria of, of space for future uh, growth. Uh, not filled quite as full. And so I think, I think that ship will uh, be one that we look to for these, these uh, large-scale experiments in the future as well. Interestingly, on the frigate, I think you, you hear us say that maybe we put a little too much transformability into the early LCS ships. We're going to go a little bit in the opposite direction, put some more permanent capabilities on uh, that give that ship more of the, what you would expect out of a frigate-like ship always remind people those first 24 LCSs are intended to replace the PCs and the mine countermeasure ships, okay? PCs and mine countermeasure ships. Those are dramatically better ships than those, those two classes and will serve well with the transformability we built in. The follow-on ships will replace the frigates. They'll be uh, more frigate-like, but still with some mission package capability that allow them to react to the threats uh, with uh, speed uh, when those threats change. And then, of course, the Ohio Replacement Program. Uh, a very, very good discussion about requirements and capabilities. Reminded folks that ship still has to be able to hide with pride for 80 years. So in 2080, that ship will still need to be able to evade the very best uh, detection technologies that are out there. And so that's, that's a very, very uh, hard requirement. It's one that we haven't backed off on. We've backed off on almost everything else. But its ability to be stealthy and protect those nuclear weapons is the non-negotiable uh, part of that, uh, that, uh, that calculus. So uh, I think I'll, I'll stop there and just finish with uh, the uh, cybersecurity piece, which we all work on uh, for our day jobs. The, the security of the ship, uh, its, its land and communication systems, its machinery controls, its combat controls, its aviation controls, is going to be a team sport. There's no way to get that uh, built, design, designed and built securely uh, without all of us pulling on that rope together. And so as we work, work to go do that, we have to build the workforce that can. And I think uh, our challenge will be that as soon as we have them trained, you will hire them. And so we have to be in the business of building good schoolhouses, building good uh, pipelines, getting them trained, getting them skilled, and understand that they are going to leave us because you'll pay them a lot more but that we have to be on that track forevermore, uh, getting them in, training them, and, uh, and then building the next cadre after that. So I'm going to stop there and turn it over to my friend Dave. Yes, sir. Thank you.
like uh, to thank Hasney for hosting this panel today. I'll put in a uh, shameless plug for my panel immediately after this panel on cybersecurity. So I'd like to thank Asney for stepping out. Uh, who would have imagined a cybersecurity panel uh, amongst this august group? Uh, but I have actually asked the panelists to target their talks to mechanical engineers, naval architects, uh, hardware double E's and power systems folks. So uh, I'm, I'm catering to the audience, I believe. Uh, I am actually going to talk about cybersecurity uh, during my segment here. Um, one of my commander's intents coming into this job back in uh, August was that there is opportunity in adversity. Oh, by the way, all of you standing on the back wall, you're making my feet hurt, and I'm sitting down. There's lots of seats up here in the front row, so I encourage you to have a seat. We've got a little while to go yet. Um, so there is opportunity in adversity. I truly believe that, and our Navy history is, is that. So rather than uh, talking about challenges in cybersecurity, I want to talk about opportunities in cybersecurity. It is providing us, having to worry about cybersecurity is giving us an opportunity to think about how we design and operate and field our systems. And I think you heard a little bit of that uh, in the last uh, hour or so. Um, so let me give you a cybersecurity threat uh, 101. Uh, if you leave your car running in the mall parking lot, how many of you think it'll still be there when you get back from two hours of shopping? Okay, so what do you do? You, take, you turn off the car and you put the key in your pocket and you lock the car. That's step one in cybersecurity. You don't run your wireless network unencrypted open. Uh, you don't leave your computer sitting out where everybody can look at it with open ports. Uh, you don't just click on links, you get an email. Oh, that looks really neat. I'll help that person from Nigeria. Um, so that's very basic stuff. Um, so that's cybersecurity first step. Um, second step I call smash and grab. Uh, someone breaks your window uh, and steals your wallet, uh, steals your television in your house. Well, what do you do for that? Well, you, you buy an alarm system, you live in a safe neighborhood, uh, you watch your P's and Q's. So that's, you know, uh, an opportunist or criminal cybersecurity. Uh, then there's another one, uh, don't encounter too much. They moved into your basement, you don't know they're there, and they take money out of your wallet when you're sleeping. Uh, they copy down the addresses in your phone book. They steal the speech you're going to give tomorrow and, and don't leave you a copy. Uh, that's the advanced persistent threat. They don't want you to know they're there. Uh, they want to stay. Uh, and you have to figure out they're there by watching what's happening in your house carefully. Uh, I left my wallet on the dining room table and now it's in the kitchen. Is that normal? So just offer those as some thoughts. It's a fairly significant behavioral change. Uh, for cyber, uh, as Admiral Dunaway mentioned, it comes in anywhere in any way. So, so as we build and design our systems, as we have built and designed our systems, we maximize the interconnectivity, we maximize the user experience, we maximize data flow between and among our systems. That's what we optimize for. Uh, in a cyber environment, we still want to do that but we want to minimize the opportunity for that person living in our basement to know what's going on. So we need to do things in our architectures and we need to do things in our systems that are now aware, now that we know about it, that there might be somebody else in there. And if there's someone else in there, we need to know things about, about how, what's normal in our system, what's normal traffic flow, what's normal behavior, uh, and then notice when things are not normal. Um, in the press you hear a lot about all the commercial hacks that are going on. One of them, a company had 400 terabytes of data removed from their database. I don't know if they thought that was normal. I would consider that to be abnormal. Uh, so did they know it was happening? I don't know. Did they have tools in place to know that removing 400 terabytes of data from their data center was a, was a, a normal thing? And if they did, could they have behaved differently? And they probably could have. So, uh, so knowing what's normal is important. Um, so like I said, we have a lot of uh, systems in the fleet. Uh, both uh, my colleagues have discussed that. 
but most of those were not designed with, with the kind of awareness I'm talking about uh, right now uh, in, when, they were, when they were designed and, and as they're operated. So, uh, and most of them are developed in a stovepipe manner. manner. So, so what uh, an AVC or an AVAIR or a spay ward did didn't really account for what the other ones were doing. So uh, we have connections, uh, but we didn't really govern that connection process. We didn't really uh, document, frankly, that connection process very well. So, so now we're going back and looking at all of those things and frankly looking at more a holistic view. Um, another thing we do really well in the Navy is not get rid of anything. Uh, in my time in the Navy, we have decommissioned exactly one computer. Uh, uh, the CP642 Bravo was the Navy's first computer. It was 15 years old when I entered the Navy, and it actually has been decommissioned. We still have Yuck 7s, we still have uh, Yuck 43s, we still, Yuck 20 lives on, not physically, but as an emulated system in my, many of our ships. So, so we don't throw anything away. That might be, a hack in a Yuck 7 might be kind of an interesting uh, task, but um, uh, we have all this old stuff, and this might be an opportunity to address that in a different way. Uh, um, during the uh, panel uh, next, uh, I'm going to talk a lot about hacking your car. Your car is kind of a microcosm of a lot of things we do in the Navy, so it's a useful open source public kind of example, so we're going to talk about that in a bit. Um, so how do we address that? Uh, defense in depth, uh, putting our stuff behind firewalls, uh, putting our stuff behind uh, gateways, putting our stuff behind uh, boundary defense cabinets, it's called enclaving, is one way to do it, kind of bricking ourselves off from the rest of the world, that works. Uh, certainly with the systems we have installed on ships and uh, other platforms today, that works. A better approach is a systems a system approach, which is why I really like what Admiral Dunaway is doing with the uh, integration uh, and I effort, uh, because that's really looking at the whole problem in a holistic way. And what connections do we need to have? What, should, what kind of data should pass through those connections? And how do we know what data is passing through those connections? So uh, I've given this example before. I used to do uh, RF stealth uh, design for DDGs, and, uh, and there's three rules in stealth. One, don't put it topside. Just don't have it out there. Can't be a radar reflector if it's not there. Two, shape it. Uh, if, if it has to be topside, shape it so that it minimizes the signature. And three, uh, put uh, radar absorbent material on it if you absolutely have to. Well, I think there's a similar standard for cyber. Don't have the interface. Can't hack an interface that doesn't exist. Uh, if you have an interface, then it needs to be very tightly controlled and you have to know exactly what it is, what's going on in that and you just can't allow certain behaviors across that interface. If it's not designed to be there, it shouldn't be there. And then lastly is a firewall or some kind of boundary defense cabinet. If you absolutely have to have the interface and it absolutely has to be high data volume, lots of variety, all that stuff, well then you need to put things on that interface to make sure that's all you're getting and you're not getting any bonus material uh, as you're operating your system. Um, one thing we are doing at Spay War is providing common base uh, standards, inspection standards for cyber. We're, we're hosting off or sourcing from the NIST, National Institute of Standard uh, 800 series cyber standards. We're adapting those for Navy use, and, and those are being promulgated. There are five, I think, that are out today. Uh, and we're doing the same thing for interface control uh, documentation between systems. So we are specifying hard standards uh, for ICDs, uh, those connections that have to exist. Uh, for systems, and that's being unrolled over the next uh, two years, bulk of activity this year and next year. Uh, and that goes to uh, all of the people who develop things and say, here's the standard that you need to follow because we've not given you that before. And then they begin to design and measure those, uh, their performance and their system designs against those standards. For those of you in the uh, contract side, you will start to see those standards showing up. Uh, in your contracts, and, and we will assess your ability to design systems against those uh, Navy standards. The other thing we're working is uh, reducing baselines. Uh, I think the best example in my world anyway is Keynes. Uh, Keynes is a uh, private cloud on the ship. That's what it is. Uh, and I give the Keynes people a lot of credit. They were doing private clouds in 2007 when all the rest of us thought clouds were things that made rain. Uh, so they were, and, and, yeah. 
Tomorrow, snow. I'm leaving this afternoon, by the way. <laughs> I've had two snowstorms on this trip. I am not doing this a third time. <laughs> uh, so uh, the key thing about Keynes is there's a common architecture across all of the dozens and dozens of applications. So when you, in the old days, when you wanted to develop a system called NIAPS, or you wanted to develop a system called MetBench, or you wanted to develop a system called ICAST, you had to go invent hardware, you had to build a rack, you had to put it on the ship, you had to have wires. Uh, today, those are all migrating or have already migrated to a software application only. No hardware desired or required. So the cyber part of it is Keynes takes care of all that stuff. Uh, you don't have to do it anymore. You as a program manager or product developer get to do just your thing, whatever it is. You don't have to worry about any of, the, uh, any of that other stuff. You don't have to worry about transport, interfaces, any of that, except your interfaces. You take care of that little piece of it. Um, and as, as Admiral Hallardy said, today, or in the future certainly, but somewhat today, if, if you're doing an upgrade on a ship, and that upgrade involves an oxyacetylene torch, you're probably doing something wrong, okay? So that ought to be a, a hint. Whoosh, ooh, maybe there's a problem here. So, uh, and, and when we talk about fielding new systems, is it faster to field a system that's got a 22-inch rack that you have to build 150 of them and install it on ships that are on a 50% on a, uh, 50, uh, 50 deployment cycle? Or is it easier to field something that's on a CD that one of your guys walks into the ship, installs it, uh, and then it operates? Uh, if we want to have rapid fielding of advanced systems, we need to be fielding software, not hardware. And as long as the underlying system, the, uh, the hardware and the operating environment that uh, sits on top of that hardware is capable of handling your piece of software, then you can just do it quickly. If you need more than that, then that's a discussion to upgrade the underlying capability. And that's kind of what ARCI did. I mean, ARCI was a negotiation between the software and the hardware people. I got software runs on your hardware, oh, I need new hardware. Okay, then there's a plan to upgrade the infrastructure, if you will, in order to bring in the new uh, capabilities that the new software brings with it. And we need to get into that cycle everywhere uh, that we can. Uh, NMCI is a good example, going to NGEN. Uh, NMCI, again, yeah, that was a very painful evolution. I was around for that. I uh, didn't like it, but the net result is we have a very secure NGEN uh, system today because we did the right things architecturally, we did the right things from a management perspective, and now we are pretty safe in that, in that environment. Um, other areas, common submarine radio room, we've done the same thing. Uh, and then just in general modularity. I described software modularity, but there's also hardware modularity, which is ARCI, and then there's modularity at the box level, which airplanes do, you put a pod on the airplane, uh, LCS does, JHSV does it, MLP does it. So there's hardware modularity and, and, uh, and cyber, building a system which is cyber tolerant and cyber defendable really drives us in the direction of modularity and systems of systems thinking. So this is an opportunity for us to make our systems better, to make them simpler, and also to, and in do, so doing, we get a better warfighting product and as a bonus, we get cyber defendable systems that, that work well. Um, I touched on cloud computing. It's a little harder for us in the Navy because we like to disconnect our ships and you know, go away. Uh, that's inherent in being a Navy. So cloud computing, I think, is gonna be a challenge for us in many areas. Ashore, not so much, uh, but things that touch a float or are a float, uh, that's gonna, we're gonna have to work through that, and, and in fact, we're doing that. Um, and I guess that's all I had. I just wanted to, uh, again, a plug for the next session. Uh, if you want to learn something, go there. Shameless, Shameless plug for the next session. Um, and again, thank you, Anthony, for, for putting this panel together. Uh, and uh, looking forward to a, a good uh, two-day uh, symposium. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Oh, so by way of wrap-up before we open up for questions, you know, you've got the three executives that uh, are stewarding an awful lot for the Navy. Uh, support the PEOs, they support the fleet. I don't know, uh, hopefully you all know they have two bosses for acquisition. They report to the RDA for in-service uh, fleet and fleet systems. They report to CNO. Uh, no one is ever calling these guys up to tell them what a great job they did uh, yesterday <laughs> on whatever. Uh, they steward technical authority, test, 
evaluation, cost, contracting, finance, decision making, and acquisition skill sets. Uh, so my hat's off to all three of you. I think you've heard a very holistic view as opposed to a syscom centric view of what these folks are doing every day for you. Let's do questions. Uh, hello, thank you so much for a great panel. Uh, my name is Greg Allen, and I'm a graduate student at Harvard. Uh, my question is for the Vice Admiral. Um, you know, there's a common app. <laughs> Uh, so there's, there's a common aphorism, you know, in engineering that if you'd asked uh, a carriage driver in 1900, you know, what technological improvements they wanted, they would say a faster horse, right, neglecting the automobile, obviously. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious, you know, where you think the, the existing process, and I have a lot of respect for, you know, those organizations that try and uh, link the warfighter to the requirements community and the engineering community, um, but where do you think your blind spots are in terms of, you know, what technologies you need to invest in and what areas you need to leave yourself open to a development in? I'm especially interested in um, autonomous systems here just because everybody I've talked to uh, in the Boston engineering community and the Silicon Valley engineering community really thinks that autonomy and robotics are about to have the next decade that looks a lot like cell phones last decade. We'll, we'll probably both answer it. So I'll, I'll start since I'm on the right. Um, so what, what is our blind spot? Our blind spot is that um, every bureaucratic system in the world attacks a problem that happens with rigor, finds root cause, creates a corrective action, implements a policy. At a high level, it's a three-page policy. Then it goes to the service. It's a 20-page policy. Then it comes to me, and I write a 400-page instruction. And that happens about once a week, and it continues for about I don't know, 20 years. So the guidance and policies, every one of them is righteous in its uh, value, right? As you look at it in isolation, when you look at it in aggregate, it creates an acquisition system that is onerous. I mean, this is an onerous system to put innovative, rapidly changing information through. Everybody talks about that. This is, I mean, there's no revelation in what I just said. That is our enemy and our uh, difficulty. What we can't get uh, is conditioned to that problem and think it's okay and normal. And we have, our blind spot is, is in the everyday fight to work your way through the acquisition system, you start to think it's normal. And it's, it's not, right? It's, there's ways to do this faster, better, cheaper. So you have to create a parallel universe that works through demonstrations, prototyping, uh, experimentation, uh, technology development, science and technology work, 6162 money, work with ONR, work with DARPA. And our shadow agency that has done that has been beaten down for years. So our blind spot is, is that we can't not protect that. We have to protect that innovative cell within our organizations that are doing the heavy lift and slogging through the acquisition process. So that's the strategy I'm taking is, I, I got it. I, you know, when it comes to a JSF, I am going to go to milestone review after milestone review, and I'm going to write oversight document after oversight document. You can't get away from it, it's probably for good reason. But when it comes to rapid innovation, uh, implementation of open architecture, um, changes to your warfighting capability showing up as a service, system of systems, systems engineering, uh, rapid insertion of technology, that requires its own skunk works, um, phantom works within an organization to do that. Mine is called Airworks. And by God, I'm going to protect it. So that's, that's the way I see it, because I, I couldn't agree with you more. It's a problem, you know. Another one is coffee cups and lanyards. Anytime somebody gets a coffee cup and a lanyard, they become an insurmountable object in my world, right? So I'm trying not to let anybody associate with a coffee cup and a lanyard, because then they start thinking about other things. So anyway, that's my input here. So I had to fill my cup up half full so that I could give you the, you know, maybe a not, not exactly the same view, but I think the same point. So if I look across my 10 warfare centers and I have experts in everything from explosives to, to hydrodynamics to uh, aluminum welding, uh, across uh, decoys warfare centers, across the system centers over at Spay War, uh, they do the work of the, the Chief of Naval Research, they do the work of DARPA. Uh, in those scientists and engineers, we have invested, and I have 18, 19,000 of them uh, they have similar kinds of numbers. In those scientists and engineers, we have invested to have people who can think outside that particular box. 
What it then takes is to get their ideas, and uh, you know, that's how railgun started, right? We started some 25 or 30 years ago on electromagnetic uh, railguns. It took us that long to beat the engineering challenges down to the point where we might see a path to a ship. And this is where I think today's environment, uh, both what you hear out of uh, the Secretary of Defense and what you hear out of our CNO is, okay, go get it wet. Get that demonstrated around the ship. Well, it'll take us five years. You have a year and a half, 18 months. I want it on a ship. Well, we better muster up the team, right, and find out what they can do. We cut them loose. And so across the enterprise, I see uh, UUV demos. I see USV demos. I see uh, uh, unmanned air aviation demos. I see new technologies in chemistry, energy, and those things, you know, some portion of the budget, 5 10%, needs to go to do some of those. Most of it's got to buy the ships that do the nation's business and the airplanes that do the nation's business. But that percentage has to be protected, and uh, you can see us starting to go pick away at it. You heard the Secretary of Defense say, we're going to stop doing that, we're going to keep investing there. And then incumbent upon us to recognize it, tee it up so that the CNO can say, no, no, get that wet. Go get it out on a ship or on an airplane, and I don't want to wait very long. And so I. I actually think the seeds are all in place. We have to make sure that as the budgets tighten and we go protect the, you know, the things that do the nation's business on a daily on a daily basis. We don't give up that kernel of goodness that exists out already inside the organization. So, you know, we really are terrible at acquisition, but somehow we managed to work to uh, field the world's greatest navy. Huh? Wonder, you know, that's a little dissonance in those two messages. But thanks, thanks Great. for the question. Actually, I want to jump in there if I can. Um, in business, uh, there's a book called The Innovator's Dilemma. It's very good. I think it's written by a Harvard person. Uh, and it says in business, they can't innovate because new ideas don't have a cash stream associated with them. Uh, in the military, new ideas don't have a constituency or a budget associated with them. Uh, and uh, a long time ago, a guy, wrote, Rosen, wrote a book, uh, Winning the Next War, How Innovation Occurs in the Military. And there's two ways. He's talking, uh, Emma Hall is talking peacetime. In peacetime, you innovate in the military by putting powerful pe people into positions of authority, and they do exactly what he said. This will take five years. No, I want it done in a year. That drives innovation in the military in peacetime. Uh, and what you see with UAVs, what you see in the UUV world is exactly that. Uh, in the cyber world, that's what you see. You see senior leaders in the Navy demanding things to happen and pounding the table. That breaks the constituencies and creates the budget, uh, which is how things get done in, in our world. got real fast at counter IED because people are dying in the field. Yeah. Next question. Good morning. My name is Lara Seligman with Inside the Navy. So I pose this question to Secretary Stackley, um, and I'm wondering, Admiral Hilardes, if you can give me a little bit more detail. So um, the destroyer Aegis modern modernizations, um, I understand the Navy has a new plan to reduce the scope of the combat modernizations. So can you tell me about this, and how much money is this going to save, and then what is the kind of impact that's going to be felt across right, the fleet? I missed the middle part. Do you, it, what, I, can you restate the question? Mm -hmm. I, did, I just missed it. Okay, so the destroyer combat modernizations, Yes. Uh, that the Navy is reducing the scope of these. So can you give me more details about that, and then the impact of that across the fleet? Yeah, so the, the choice that you have each year, uh, we do some 50, uh, large maintenance availabilities on ships across the fleet each year. Uh, those are in our public shipyards and in the, in the private yards uh, overseen by the regional maintenance centers. Those availabilities are opportunities to upgrade the ship. Now you have to do the things that get the ship to its service life, paint the tanks, make sure the flight deck is up to standards, uh, uh, fix the broken equipment. Each of those is an opportunity to go upgrade the ship as well and bring it to a more, a more modern baseline. Uh, in the budget years where it's tight, you put in, you, you have a goal to modernize every ship that goes into one of those availabilities. And then in the balance of the budget, when you decide how many, penultimately, how many ships you're going to buy and how many airplanes you're going to buy, and how many networks we're going to buy, you, you end up having to choose 
the fungible number in that is the number of, of, of availabilities that, that have those big modernizations. When the number falls to zero, you're at failure criteria. When the number goes from 10 to five, you're, you're dialing the fleet's capability for the near term. Uh, the bet there is that when money comes, if, the, you know, if tomorrow a war starts and we say, hey, you better go get those five ships modernized, CNO said to me, can you do it in three months? And I said, well, yeah, if we got all the money in the world, yeah, we can do it really fast. And so I think what it, you see that is that's just the vernier that we choose. The ship, when it came in, was perfectly capable, it had just come off a battle group deployment where it defended an aircraft carrier and that, that uh, weapon system was very good. The, be the next generation of it would be much better, be more cyber secure, be more capable of NIFCA, uh, and then you just have to choose how many of those do you have and, and how many can you afford. And so I think it's a, it's a demonstration of what happens when you really tighten five or six years in a row and the slack comes out of all of our programs. That's something you, that's, that's all that's left to give is those kind, of, those kind of poker chips, unless you want to give up ships. And I think you heard the Secretary of Navy, we're not giving up any ships out of the shipbuilding program. So thank you for that question. Thank you. got time. Hi, uh, my name is Bob Galway. I work for the Naval Surface Warfare Center. Uh, quick question. Uh, for, uh, Secretary Kendall had mentioned that uh, strengthening the organic capability of the civilian workforce was one of his issues. Uh, Senator, uh, Under Secretary Stackley mentioned it as well. Uh, I'm curious about a plan for uh, getting design and, and production knowledge into the civilian acquisition workforce and uh, if there's a plan up for that. Um, there's nothing more valuable to me than my 24,000 civilians that uh, are in my workforce. And uh, I have many that are very chronologically challenged and liable to leave me in the next five years. In fact, I would say 11,000 between last year and in the next five years, 11,000 of my 24,000 not only are eligible to retire, but past eligibility to retire, I'm probably going to. So um, I'm hiring as fast as I can. Uh, last year we hired 2,300 people and it's probably 1,800 people this year just to meet attrition of folks going out of my workforce. Um, I've also been blessed to uh, follow Dr. Al Samaroff, who is the uh, uh, deputy commander at NAV Air for, I don't know, millennia. I don't know how long he was. He was uh, I don't ever remember him not being there uh, in my life, but he did a fantastic job of protecting the, uh, the core intellectual capital of our workforce. And so if you go through my competency line organization, get down to the core competence of each area, we have world-class knowledge and it's being cultivated and transferred over to this new generation that's coming in. We created our own university. We have our own methodologies of, of growing that and we're trying to challenge it more and more. Uh, for, I mentioned this earlier, we had abdicated many of the standards that I believe to be inherently governmental for years and years and years. We got to quit doing that. And as you do that, you bring those standards back into the government, like a system of system standards to, in, in, uh, to execute a warfighting capability, NIFCA, SUW. Uh, when you bring that standard in and you take those people and you put them on this standard and you devolve it in a very detailed, functional, and technical way, and they're working it every day, they start to be that core base of knowledge of warfighting capability that then can tap back into industry, and, and that's what we're doing. We're creating the language, the school, the university, the knowledge base, the next generation of thinking that goes from closed-in systems to open system of systems, open architecture, cybersecurity on the fly, rapid insertion of capability. That's what we're building our way to right now. I, I think we're in great shape in naval aviation, uh, and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't be happier. Would I, would I like to be further? Absolutely. Uh, but given the sequestration, no raises, you know, never, you know, I've never seen a system more willing to kick a civilian uh, government worker while he was down and they get right back up and come to work. It's fantastic. I love it. Yeah. Anyway, that's how we're working. Thank you. So I think I think uh, you were also asking as I as I listened to your question, are we going to start designing ships 
uh, at NAFC again. That, that, that's a question I get often in, from naval architects and others that have been in that business. Sort of of the three levels, uh, a preliminary design, a contract design, then a detailed design. I don't think we're ever bringing detailed design back into the government. I think that, that, that where that is is, is appropriately uh, uh, at, the, at the shipbuilders with uh, significant government oversight in all the technical areas that matter most uh, to the Navy. We are regrowing our capabilities in the in the first two, in the in the preliminary design and in the in the oversight of contract design. And and each ship we build, uh, I think that the current uh, replacement oiler is an opportunity for us to do much of that work in the government. And in fact, we have uh, the the LXR, the amphibious ship uh, LSD replacement, will be an opportunity to exercise those. Uh, in the Ohio replacement design, we are training hundreds to thousands of government civilians over how to oversee and be part of a design team that, that uh, starts from a set of requirements and, and ultimately builds a ship that sails off into harm's way. And so that, that clear-eyed view that's not just called the, the uh, Challenge folks, yeah, chronological, uh, chronological challenge, challenge, challenge folks, is make sure that there are young people on that team as well, and we spend a lot of time making sure we're taking each one of those opportunities to train the next generation. I, I, I uh, see a, you know, uh, a very, very substantive effort to continue that growth of, of it now that we've got uh, much of it back in the government. So thanks, thanks for the question. Thank you. Did you? Nope. Thank you. Gentlemen, good morning. Uh, thank you for your time. I'm Lieutenant Commander Kyle Warner. I'm an engineering duty officer in OPNAV and OZ. Uh, my, my question is on the program management of autonomous systems. Uh, considering that uh, autonomous systems span all three of your syscoms and multiple program executive offices, the CNO's tenants on payloads over platforms, and that currently most of uh, autonomous programs are managed by acquisition professionals, uh, first, do you support maturing a small cadre of engineering duty officers to be program managers for autonomous systems? And if so, how do you envision the most effective way to cross all three of your syscoms to identify the right jobs to create a career path for engineering duty officers? Yeah, so, um, you know, I'm sure we'll all dive in on this. Um, autonomy is a discipline like anything else. And I think there's people that will go deep and well into it and become autonomous specialists. I always get worried when you get a coffee cup and a lanyard. If you have one that says, I am an autonomist and a lanyard, you're gonna be hard to work with because autonomy, more than anything, stretches across everything, right? And so it's gotta fit, and it's, it's got to be uh, autonomy where autonomy makes sense, and it's gotta have proper checks and balances, and, and the implementation of it's gonna be fascinating because by definition, you're relinquishing control. And you're looking at three biggest control freaks in the world sitting up here on this stage, right? <laughs> we, we control everything. You know, when I say airworthy, by God, I do it out of complete control. And the nukes are worse than I am, right? So, so what you're saying is, is that we, you want us to relinquish complete control. And we're going to have to get our heads around that, right? We're going to have to get our heads around unmanned vehicles being downrange and making choices when they're not in comms. And um, the, the best example I've seen of it are ants, right? You know, ants can say yes, no, and maybe with their antennas. They touch yes, no, positive, negative, neutral, charge. And that's how they communicate. And a dang ant pile in Africa can detect a zebra that's dead a mile, a half a mile away from its nest, get everybody rallied over there, take it apart, and get it back into their nest within a day, right? So that's all autonomous work with little touches of the antennas downrange. And what we're seeing is, is that you know, like Abraham Lincoln, you know, if I'd have just had more time, I would have made my speech much shorter, right? If, if we can just take the time with autonomy to make it simple, then we'll be able to relinquish that control as it goes downrange. The more complicated it gets, the harder it's going to be because we won't be able to see the risks and the avenues of failure uh, as it goes downrange. So I think it's great to get people that are smart and study it and bring them in. I, I worry about getting anybody too deep in one field because then they become a problem. They've got to be able to work that field across a number of different fields so that we can create the outcomes we need. Yeah, my, my, uh, my initial reaction to that is that uh, uh, currently and in the near to medium term, 
pretty much every autonomous system that we've thought about, that we've imagined, is going to get to the point of effect on a ship or an airplane. That, that it's going to be, you know, it doesn't give itself a ride there, and it's going to have to get off, go do its business, get back on, get recharged, get downloaded, get uh, upgraded, and, and out. I worry it, that, you know, you go build a UUV, for example, and, and it doesn't fit in any tube we own, doesn't fit in any payload interface we've ever invented. That thing's going to spend a lot of time sitting on a pier. That's just the way that it is. And so I, I see it as integral to the, you know, that if you take the autonomous people and you disconnect them from the platform that's going to deliver them and the people who are going to handle them, that ultimately you'll, you'll head off in the wrong direction. The autonomy work, uh, lots going on there, and that's not just in the government. There are a lot of people working on autonomy, and I think we should go make sure we're in a position to leverage it. But as part of a larger system engineering effort to go get the thing onto something that's going to get it to the fight. Uh, it's probably not going to get itself to the fight. Now, if eventually we build, you know, UVs as big as submarines, they can get themselves to the fight. Then you, then you'd be asking yourself, well, what, what did we, what, what it was that that you intended to con to save out of all that? Um, I've watched uh, unmanned underwater vehicles all the way back to the beginning of my career, and the best one I've ever seen is called a Mark 48 torpedo. Pretty autonomous. It's got a wire. If the wire breaks, it's got to go still hit the hit the target, it goes, you know, very fast, it goes a long distance, it's got a big bomb. Uh, that, that is the kind of thing that, uh, that's well engineered and part of the whole war fighting system. It's not autonomy for its own sake. So, uh, great question. So it is, it has to be part of our system engineering and I would not advocate, as Decor said, somebody just being about autonomy, that, that you'd, you'd uh, miss the bigger picture. How are you gonna get to the fight? Okay, I'll give a different view then. Uh, go west, young man. Uh, do not wait for the Navy to give you permission to be good at autonomy. If that's what you want to do, do it. Uh, carve your own path. And, uh, and I think uh, um, it is a growing area, and I think you latched on to something. You might be a little ahead of the power curve. Eh, okay. Uh, you might be on the power curve, uh, but the Navy, one of the things I really, really like about the Navy is we are highly tolerant of very innovative thinkers and people. I mean, Rick Over, uh, Wayne Meyer, uh, who's the Polaris guy? Uh, Ray, Rayburn. Ray, Rayburn. Uh, so we, and uh, you go back into, you know, carrier aviation in the 30s, some very, very, very innovative people. And as an organization, we like we're, we're, I don't know if we like it, but we're tolerant of that. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> What's your name again? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and if you're right, uh, as Admiral Hlarnas said, you know, with all the bureaucracy and all the backing and forthing and everything else, we do re always build the best stuff. Everybody else wants our stuff. I mean, like everybody else in the world. Uh, and uh, so the process produces the best stuff. And I think one of the parts of the process I really like is the part that lets... Uh, uh, people think creatively, and the, and, the, and the organization and the bureaucracy accommodates that at, at certain levels. And uh, so I'd say go for it. And, uh, and as long as you're keen on it and pushing it, uh, uh, the Navy probably will be accommodating of that. And if not, hey, too bad for them. You can go do it somewhere else. Thank you. Last question. Admiral Wyatt. I'm Bill Wyatt, retired, retired, and I represent no one but myself. <laughs> Uh, my question is kind of focused on NAVC and PEOs uh, and really revolves around the next cruiser. Um, I admire what the submarine community is doing. I know at the Submarine League recently they talked about an SSNX looking beyond Virginia. I cannot for the life of me understand why we have not seriously started some initial studies on the next cruiser. We know Aegis cruisers have got to be replaced. Um, you spill more money than it would take to start a study. You know? <laughs> and I guess my, my question really is, are you constrained in your view or directly or indirectly from starting some, say, 05 preliminary studies for a cruiser? Uh, am I constrained? 
Uh, I certainly am constrained resource-wise in what we commit people to do. We have several, you know, surface uh, combatant and, and auxiliary design programs going on, including uh, Flight 3 of the DDGs, which, which will dramatically change that platform. I, I, would, I would say this is I see us moving to a, a discussion much more about small combatants and large combatants. The difference between a DDG at 96,000 tons or 10,500 tons and a, and, and a DDG at 14,500 tons, which is what, where Zumwalt's going to be, and a cruiser at, you know, 13.2 or 12.6, that, that line is, I would say, completely blurred. I would say, what is after Flight 3 DDG? Uh, we're just now finishing the design of that and starting construction in 16. That would be then the time to go start the next large service combatant study. I wouldn't advocate it be a cruiser or destroyer. It's a large service combatant. And what is the what is the margin? How much space and weight do you need? What is the future air and missile defense threat look like? And then and then head down that path. I don't think we're constrained. I th I think we are constrained in the resources to do it. Those resources are tied up right now. I think as they come off that those projects, they will naturally go. And I think you'll see us do a large service combatant study in the next couple of years. And I got be I. I don't know what year it'll start, but, but uh, I'm certain we'll advocate that it start in time to catch those people and make sure they stay in the government working on ship designs, not head out to do other things. So it is, it is about time, probably not yet this year. Thank you, though, for that. Yeah. Well, aye, aye. Let me uh, just take that one up for a sec. Uh, just before I retired in 08, we did almost a year worth of CGX studies. Mm -hmm. And uh, you heard the secretary mention it this morning. And that, and that ship was just uh, totally unaffordable. Uh, so I think you know, if you follow Admiral Hilarda's lead, it's large combatants, small combatants, and, and you're, it's an evolutionary thing. Uh, so let's not get hung up on displacement. And we could argue all day on, uh, on surface displacement uh, of ships. And uh, it's what's the combat capability. It's not necessarily how many missiles you're carrying, although that sure helps. It's what's the total combat capability of the platform. And you want to call it a cruiser, a destroyer, or a large surface combatant. The, you know, the era of CGs do this, DDGs do this, frigates do this is, is probably over. So. All right. I would like to thank my three panelists. And uh, Tony, uh, I'm, th I'm assuming we have the same, uh, same protocol here where uh, a donations were made to you all. And thanks again.